Hello and welcome everyone to this first session of the Conspirituality Science and COVID-19 Colloquium. I'm Professor Andrew Singleton and uh, I'm a Professor of Sociology and Social Research at uh, Deakin University. Other people will do the introductions, but I'm here to do um, an acknowledgement of country. And uh, we do that as a, as a, as a, a formal recognition of the traditional owners of the lands of which we're meeting virtually today. So I will now do that acknowledgement of country. As we gather for this meeting, physically dispersed and virtually constructed, let us take a moment to reflect the meaning of place and in doing so recognise the various traditional lands on which we do our business today. We acknowledge the elders past, present and emerging of all the lands on which we work and live and their ancestral spirits and we acknowledge them with gratitude and respect. Thank you and thanks for your attendance at what is going to be a very important discussion in light of recent global events and hopefully in the next couple of days we can come to a better understanding of the motivations and impact of a range of new social movements that have become increasingly prominent in recent times. I'll now uh, invite Greg Barton to speak next. Uh, thank you, Andrew, and um, welcome all, particularly to speakers who have got up very early in the morning from the other side of the world to be with us. Uh, I'm a professor of global Islamic politics at Deakin University, but specifically in the Alfred Deakin Institute for Citizenship and Globalization, which is one of the, the uh, co-sponsors of this, um, uh, this meeting and of this uh, Conspirituality in Australia research project along with Western Sydney University and, of course, the University of Birmingham and the uh, International Research Network for Science and Belief in Society, uh, funded by the Templeton Religion Trust. So we're really very excited at Deakin and at ADI um, to have this project. It's, it's uh, led by Anna, it's taken off with um, great vision and passion, and uh, we'll hear momentarily from uh, Christina and from Anna about the project. Uh, but it brings together a, a lot of our common interests in understanding spirituality and meaning in the context of this COVID-19 um, era of the pandemic and anxiety and, and uh, turning inwards towards uh, conspiratorial explanations. So uh, thank you all. And um, I, I'm sure it's going to be a fascinating uh, series of discussions, a really great line of speakers. It's great to see such enthusiasm and, and such collegiality. Um, it's a really encouraging development in a time of anxiety that we can come together in such a collegial fashion. Thank you. I'll ask Christina, sorry, to, uh, to pick up from where I've left off and explain the project. If I am mute myself. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Christina Rocha, and I'm one of the conveners of this colloquium and in a CI in the project with Anna and Andrew and Alex Wojcinski and then Chi uh, Wang. So I, I am in Sydney, I'm not in Melbourne, so I'd like to do the uh, acknowledgement of country here in Sydney as well. I would like to begin by acknowledging the Yora people, traditional custodians of the land on which I am today, and pay my respects to their indigenous elders past and present. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. So I'm a professor of anthropology and director of the religion and society research cluster at Western Sydney University. And on behalf of WSU, I welcome you all here today, particularly those who come from overseas virtually and have woken up very early in the morning to be here. I should also like to thank the International Research Network for the study of science and belief in society at the University of Birmingham for funding the project uh, which led to this colloquium. So the project is called Conspirituality and Science of uh, and the COVID-19 Pandemic in Australia, Material and Digital Practices. And I'm thrilled that we have, uh, we are able to have a forum here to discuss such a significant topic. Just today, the Australian conspiracy theory and chef Pete Evans went to Parliament House in Canberra to meet with Craig Kelly. Um, for those who don't know, he's an Australian politician and climate change denier who has been spreading medical misinformation and giving a platform for, to conspiracy theories. So we can say that, you know, they're what, 
Craig Potts or Craig Kelly may lose his seat after all this, you know, all these conspiracy theories in the next election. But still, meeting at Parliament House shows that how significant this and topical this uh, discussion is uh, for us in Australia, but also globally, as humanity has seems to be dithering and divided over how to best protect ourselves in the face of threats, be it COVID-19 or climate change. And of course, they are connected. So conspirituality doesn't happen in a vacuum. And I guess what I would like for us to draw from this colloquium is an understanding of how we got here and how we're going to change things, how we're going to change, uh, make things better. So thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here and, and with you all to, tonight and tomorrow all day. And I uh, ask please Anna Halafov to come and um, tell us much, um, tell us a bit more about the, the project. Thank you. Thanks so much, Christina. So Christina summarized things very well. And at our presentation, our keynote panel tomorrow, uh, we will discuss the project in greater detail and also introduce the project team. So what I would just like to focus on now is just a quick round of thank yous, uh, particularly to our international speakers and um, who are waking up at all, all hours to be able to join us um, at different times over this evening and all day tomorrow. Um, I'd also like to thank our distinguished Australian speakers as well and also thank our research institutes who have enabled us to not only host this uh, colloquium, but also to undertake a research project that has been generously and kindly funded uh, by the International Research Network for Science and Belief in Society, which is based at the University of Birmingham and funded by the Templeton Religion Trust. Uh, and so you'll see the logos there on the screen. Uh, the, Alfred Deakin Institute has supported our preliminary research uh, when we were applying for the grant through the INSBS and also Western Sydney University is a partner with Christina Rocha as being one of our chief investigators also. Um, I would also like to very much thank our team and in particular thank uh, Dr. Enchi Wang for her work in coordinating the colloquium and also Alex Rajinsky for assisting her and uh, Emily Marriott as well. And um, we have a whole team of RAs who are behind the scenes acting as moderators to the Q&A discussion. Christine is gonna just run through the uh, instructions and the guidance of how it works, this webinar format. And we very much welcome your participation as attendees uh, in the Q&A function, which Christine will outline a bit more now. So I think uh, we can just start or start uh, the session a little early with a bit of um, information on how things will work. And thank you again to everyone for being here. And we look forward to rich uh, presentations and discussions on, as has been mentioned, a very timely uh, and interesting topic. So thank you again to everyone. And Christina, over to you. Okay, everyone, um, welcome to the Conspirituality Colloquium. And this panel is on Conspirituality and COVID-19. So to all attendees, we welcome your questions at any time. Uh, but we are going to uh, do the questions on the Q&A function, the Q&A box. So the chat function will be, um, it's, it's not working. Uh, so please enter your questions on the Q&A box. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the questions to the presenters. So we're going to have three presenters, 20 minutes each, um, and then we're going to have half an hour for Q&A. Um, we ask all participants, because this, this conspirituality is such a controversial topic, we ask participants to engage civilly. Any abusive and disruptive behavior will not be tolerated and anyone who engages in it will be removed from the colloquium. Okay, so today we have three speakers um, in this session. The first speaker is 
Professor David Voss, and I hope I have um, pronounced his name correctly. Um, David Voss is a professor at University College in London, where he led the UCL Social Research Institute until 2020. He's a demographer and sociologist of religion. He was the European Values Study National Program Director for Great Britain from 2008 to 2020. And he's co-editor of the British Religion in Numbers, an online center for British data on religion. Now, this is important. David is co-author of the paper, The Emergence of Conspirituality, which was published in 2011 and introduced the term conspirituality into discussions of belief and attitudes in contemporary society. So thank you, David, for accepting our invitation. Um, and the floor is yours. So uh, those who are not presenting, please turn off your videos so that David can, and I'll turn off mine, and mute, please, your videos. So David, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here and wonderful to have this opportunity to revisit conspirituality 10 years after that paper that you mentioned was published and actually something like 12 after it was written. So just for those of you who aren't aware of uh, this uh, neologism, it describes the synthesis between conspiracy theory and the holistic milieu. And this hybrid system of belief had already been noticed, but it had received relatively little attention from scholars or the general public. And that relative neglect, I think it's fair to say, continued until recently, at least outside the academy, when discussions of the phenomenon took off in the mainstream media. Let me start by giving credit where credit is due. Uh, which is in large part to people who are outside universities. Charlotte Ward wasn't an academic, but she recognized the importance of the phenomenon and gave it a name. And the paper was really her work. I'd also like to recognize the role of Jules Evans in focusing public attention on conspirituality. And that was impressively continued by the three musketeers of conspirituality.net, Derek, Matthew, and Julian, uh, who will be appearing here tomorrow. At first glance, it's surprising, I think, that there should be an overlap between conspiracy theory, which we tend to think of, uh, rightly or wrongly, as male-dominated, often conservative, generally pessimistic, typically concerned with current affairs, and alternative spirituality, which is predominantly female, progressive, self-consciously optimistic, and largely focused on the self and personal relationships. We argued in our paper that the principles that Barkun identified as underlying most conspiracy theories, namely nothing happens by accident, nothing is as it seems, and everything is connected, can also be found in much new age thought. These world views make public and personal life respectively seem less subject to random forces and therein lies part of their appeal. Conspirituality does now seem to be a rapidly growing web movement. Uh, it's been going for some time, uh, expressing an ideology fueled by disillusionment and the widening of the window of discourse on wellness and current affairs. What were formerly seen as fringe ideas have moved into general awareness in part because of the polarization of American politics and in part because of the drama of this global pandemic and the vaccination programs that are now underway. The proponents of conspirituality in its narrow sense believe that the best strategy for dealing with the threat of a totalitarian deep state or a new world order is to act in accordance with an awakened new paradigm worldview. But they're addressing a much wider audience and particularly in the wellness community, composed of people who may not be persuaded by the extremes of either conspiracism or spiritual awakening, but are open to some of these ideas. Postmodern culture 
is high on tolerance, but low on discrimination. So people are open to practically any ideas and unwilling to reject any as clearly fallacious. One of my favorite examples comes from the original orig uh, religion monitor survey, where I was responsible for writing up the results from Great Britain and Australia. I think actually I presented some of this work in Australia quite some years ago. Respondents to that survey who were at least slightly religious were asked whether they agreed or disagreed with the statements, quote, I'm convinced that in questions of religion, my own religion is right, while other religions tend to be wrong. In both countries, Great Britain and Australia, half of the participants totally disagreed with the statement. So tolerance is such a powerful feature of modern morality that people are more willing to accept religious relativism than to assert that their own religion is right. Now that unwillingness to say that other religions tend to be wrong might seem admirable, uh, but it could lead to a position of being unwilling to say that any worldview is wrong. If all beliefs are equal, it's not clear how we're meant to decide what to believe. Astrology is another case in point. In a 2018 article in the Atlantic magazine, the author notes, and I'll quote, a prevailing attitude among many of the people I talk to that it doesn't matter if astrology is real, it matters if it's useful, unquote. Apparently some people find that astrological analysis prompts them to think about their lives. The problem with this kind of extreme pragmatism where you can pretend that astrology works if it's personally beneficial, is that personal intuition becomes the touchstone of truth. In relation to the overlap between spirituality and conspiracy, it seems fairly clear that we're mostly concerned about people moving from the spiritual milieu into conspiracism. I doubt that conspiracy theory is a common gateway to reflecting on mind, body, spirit connections. So if there's a risk to the general welfare, it's that people doing yoga or other relatively benign activities come to be influenced by conspiracism. Late modernity celebrates liberty, democracy, individualism, qualities that free us from authority and make everyone equal. But we also find new forms of authority derived from expert knowledge, occupational standing, and media access. That being so, it's not surprising that those left behind who recorded little respect and frustrated by their limited agency, kick back against the elitist drive to maintain control. It's easy to feel like an outsider. You might be familiar um, with Hirschman's discussion of what religious organizations offer to new immigrants, refuge, respectability, and resources. If you lack status in the rational technocratic order, online spiritual or conspiracist communities provide a potential venue for refuge, respectability, and at least for those who become sufficiently prominent, resources. Although the stereotype of the conspiracy theorist is a middle-aged man sitting at a laptop in his basement, conspiracism can serve as a surrogate community. You'll know the QAnon slogan, where we go one, we go all. People are given a sense of belonging to the elect, the cognoscenti, those who see the truth and are now united in opposition to an arrogant elite. The idea of togetherness was one of the appeals of the new age or holistic milieu to use that term. But when skepticism about modernity becomes an authoritarian attack on evidence and expertise, the dark side of alternative spirituality is apparent. Alternative spirituality connects with alternative medicine, which is suspicious of mainstream medical science, including vaccination. To contest mainstream wisdom requires explaining why it's mistaken, which is a challenge for people without expert credentials. Conspiracy theories are a natural recourse. There's a similar point to make about the New Age in general. It's interesting that one of the most uh, popular books containing New Age ideas about human transformation, published in 1980, was entitled The Aquarian Conspiracy. 
Now, Marilyn Ferguson, the author, used the term conspiracy there to mean simply that many people were acting in concert, their actions were benign. But when the spiritual revolution failed to occur, some explanation was called for. David Robertson, who will be talking to us shortly in this session, has highlighted the way that failed prophecy promotes conspiracism. Why people believe what they believe is in large part a matter of personality or other psychological characteristics. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not able to do more than speculate about individual circumstances that lead people into either spirituality or conspiracism or both. And although I agree with Jules Evans about the potential role of mental illness, trauma and loneliness, I also agree with him that pathologi uh, pathologizing unconventional belief isn't a good move by people who study religion. My focus then will be on the cognitive side of conspirituality. I'd like to outline two key themes. The first is that everyone, all of us, are torn between trust and doubt. Who or what can be trusted? Who or what should be doubted and how? Note that these dilemmas are at the heart of some occupations. Ours, for example, academics are trained in the dominant paradigms of their disciplines, uh, but we're also instructed to take nothing for granted. All knowledge is revisable. Journalists are likewise in the business of doubting and questioning. To that extent, then, people who are involved in spirituality and conspiracism aren't unusual. What makes them different is who and what they do or don't question or trust. The second theme relates to types of what's been called epistemic vigilance, roughly how we check our knowledge. I, I'm indebted here to the work of my friend, uh, Conrad Talmut Kaminsky, who in turn builds on the observations of Dan Sperber. The distinctions between source and content. When we're presented with a statement, we consider it source and our willingness to accept that statement as true is linked to our assessments of how reliable that person or institution is as a source of information, either in general or specifically on the matter at hand. At the same time, we consider the content of the statement and weigh it up against our existing knowledge and any additional knowledge we can acquire that might support or undermine it. Talmot Kaminsky has used these two forms of epistemic vigilance as a way of characterizing the difference between science and religion. To quote him, both science and religion are human endeavors that recruit and modify pre-existing human capacity to engage in epistemic vigilance. However, while science relies upon a focus on content vigilance, religion focuses on source vigilance. The diff this difference is due, in turn, to the function of religious claims not being connected to their accuracy, unlike the function of scientific claims. So in brief, the idea is that religious truth claims are generally founded on an appeal to particular sources, uh, for example, scripture and human authorities, but sometimes experiences of a special character like revelations, visions, and so on. In theory, at least, where the message originates matters more than what it contains. When it comes to judging whether we should, uh, that's when we're trying to judge whether to believe it. By contrast, science deploys methods such as double blinds peer review to try to focus attention on the content rather than the source of new information. So all of us have to rely on guidance from a chosen source on most technical issues, we're unlikely to be competent to evaluate biomedical research in, for example, virology or immunology, but we may have confidence in the scientists who do that work. To that extent, we're vicariously relying on content vigilance. But some people distrust modern science and place more credence in practitioners of alternative medicine or spiritual substitutes for conventional treatments. Among both trusters and distrusters, the actual information is accepted or rejected largely on the basis of where it comes from. But it's likely, of course, that pre-existing worldviews and beliefs are influential in shaping those choices. So content 
as well as source has a role uh, even for ordinary people. Two factors are key in assessing the source of information. We need to decide whether sources know what they're talking about. We also need to decide whether they're telling us the truth as they see it. So we have subject area credibility on the one hand and honesty or goodwill on the other. You might not trust a source either because you don't regard them as well informed or because you suspect that they have an interest in leading you to believe one thing rather than another. Note that when someone holds an opinion that we reject, we feel obliged to explain, if only to ourselves, why the other person is wrong. We require a theory of error, if you like, that accounts for the wrongness and justifies our rejection of it. If your point of view enjoys broad support among those who are deemed to be knowledgeable on the matter, it's relatively straightforward to point to failings in the individuals who disagree. They may be misinformed, misled, prejudiced, mentally unstable, morally flawed, or whatever. But if you hold an opinion that's contrary to the common or expert consensus, it becomes more difficult to defend your position. You now need to explain how the majority, or at least people with authority, reject your views. Perhaps ordinary people are misinformed or misled, but those in positions of power should have access to the truth. There's almost no alternative to claiming that they are deliberately concealing that truth in order to protect their selfish interests. To, to put it another way, the more unconventional your beliefs, the more likely it is that you'll have to resort to some theory of error that involves an elite conspiracy misleading the masses. Let me try to put some of these ideas together in relation to conspirituality and COVID. There's much that we don't know about the disease, including even its origins, nature, treatments, prevention and consequences. Knowledge is gradually accumulating, of course. Even so, the sheer magnitude of the gaps in our understanding leaves space for skepticism. To mention some of the issues that we're grappling with, there's uncertainty about the origins of the virus, uncertainties about the, the uncertainties about the virology, immunology and epidemiology around the disease and its transmission. Uh, there are concerns about the balance between protecting public health and the economy, trade-offs between individual liberties and the collective welfare, and uh, how far we need to go to prevent healthcare systems from being overwhelmed, as debated, and the political problems of maintaining popular consent. Reasonable people can differ on all of these issues, but some of them provide an opening for outlandish claims. For example, uncertainty about the origins of the virus has been helpful to, to those who want to link it to germ warfare, 5G, Bill Gates, and so on. Opposition based on extreme views, for example, that lockdowns are ineffective or masks don't help, shade into conspiracy theories based on false beliefs. For example, that COVID is no worse than flu, that vaccines are dangerous, that hospitals are actually quiet, uh, that the pandemic is bogus and a pretext for hidden forces to acquire more power. There's a recent book entitled, A Lot of People Are Saying, The New Conspiracism and the Assault on Democracy uh, by two political scientists. They point out that in the past, conspiracists worked hard to dig up facts that could be linked together in support of their theories. And to quote them, what we're seeing today is something different, conspiracy without the theory. Its proponents dispense with evidence and explanation. Their charges take the form of bare assertion. The election is rigged. Yet the accusation does not point to any evidence of fraud. Validation of conspiracy claims takes the form of repetition and assent. Even the most casual likes and retweets give authority to senseless, destructive charges. Hence the title, a lot of people are saying, end of quote. So what we find then is a kind of crowdsourced knowledge where there's no competent source, no reliable content, 
but the spread of rumor is taken to be support for the content of the rumor. In terms of epistemic vigilance, we see an inversion of the usual attention to source. Instead of being more inclined to believe people who are experts, the populist is less inclined to believe them. A notorious example uh, in the UK came three weeks before our referendum in 2016 on leaving the European Union. Michael Gove, who was then Lord Chancellor and one of the leaders of the campaign to leave the EU, was challenged to explain why people should believe him rather than a long list of authorities on the likely consequences of Brexit. And his response was, quote, the people in this country have had enough of experts. So similarly, some practitioners of alternative spirituality and wellness lead people to believe harmful things, not so much because they exercise charismatic authority as sources of truth, but because they promote and exploit a mistrust of expert sources of knowledge. They claim either that experts are blinkered by conventional paradigms, or that they, those experts, are servants of the elite, paid to mislead the public. Content plays a part because contemporary culture is uncomfortable with external standards of right and wrong, even regarding facts rather than norms, and people are expected to judge for themselves. And thus the forces of postmodernism and populism converge in undermining trust and spirituality becomes a vehicle for transmitting the virus of conspiracism. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. That was perfect on time. Thank you. Very exciting paper. Um, so while we wait for people to come on board and ask questions, I was thinking a little bit of um, asking what led you to write that seminal paper in 2011 when, you know, it was not such at the forefront of our minds, uh, conspirituality was not there so much. Can you talk a bit about that context? Certainly. As I said at the outset, I do want to give uh, credit to the first author on that paper, Charlotte Ward. As I say, she wasn't an academic, but she was very much a participant and observer, if you like, uh, in this phenomenon, uh, and had the detachment to see that actually it was of academic and public interest, uh, and so wanted to write about it. Uh, but as David Robertson and other colleagues have noted, this is a phenomenon that actually has deep roots and has been around for long, a long time. So um, I don't want to say that we were by any means the first to notice it. Uh, it's just that uh, we were perhaps fortunate to have recognized that it was something worth writing about and um, to pick up a very catchy <laughs> name for the phenomenon. Yes, yes, which has led to where we are today. So how do you see the changes from, you know, in this, in this decade and particularly mm. with online, right, with, with social media? And we, yeah. we're going to discuss this quite a lot, particularly with the three musketeers as you call them mm -hmm. <laughs> spirituality podcast but how has things changed in this decade you know to be perfectly honest i've tried to stay away from it for most of the past decade uh, most of my work involves other things um that said it has clearly been bubbling away in the background and the current era provides uh, really fertile grounds for the explosion of, of these ideas, partly because of what's going on in American politics and partly because of the pandemic. So uh, uh, although I don't think that it was ever exclusively something based on the web, it's been fueled by the existence of the web and uh, more recently various social media platforms um, and now uh, it's, I think, of significant uh, public interest. Thank you, David. I'm sorry I just made a boo-boo here. I did say that we're going to have the three first speakers and then we'll go for question and answer, and that's what we're going to do. Um, so um, thank you so much, David. Our next speaker 
is David Robertson. David Robertson is a lecturer in religious studies at the Open University, and he's a co-founder of the Religious Studies Project and co-editor of the journal Implicit Religion. He works, his work applies critical theory to the study of alternative and emerging religions, conspiracy theory narratives, and the disciplinary history of the study of religions with a particular interest in claims of special knowledge. He is the author of UFOs, The New Age and Conspiracy Theories, Millennial Conspiracism, published by Bloomsbury in 2016, and co-editor of After World Religions, Reconstructing Religious Studies, Equinox 2016, and co-editor also of the, oh, and co-editor also of the Handbook for, of Conspiracy Theories and Contemporary Religion, published by Brill, 2018. So thank you so much, David, for coming to speak to us today. The floor is, is yours. My pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Um, okay, are you seeing my screen there? Yes. Yeah, okay, good. Um, so this should follow on quite nicely, actually. It was really nice to hear David speaking about um, the sort of epistemic issues around it, because it's something that I've found very interesting recently. And um, Mar talking about the different ways that uh, these, you know, at first glance incompatible areas of um, the cultic milieu uh, kind of cross over. What I'm going to talk about today is mostly um, to do with the way that people can move around um, these different areas. I mean, from, you know, conspiracies to um, the holistic milieu, or I'll probably just keep using New Age because that's my habit. I mean the same thing. Um, and different, uh, how these cross over and, and how people can move from apparently completely contradictory ideas into into other uh, into other areas over time. Um, I want to start with this this map, uh, the Great Awakening map, which has been uh, circulating quite a bit recently um, as the Q map, um, even though actually it originates. Uh, quite a bit before Q, this is about version 11 or version 12 of it or something. Um, and if I zoom in a little bit, you can see um, this sort of more political uh, earth-based area of it, that circle um, just on the edge of the screen is, is the earth and we've got Q and on down there. Um, and obviously there's, uh, it, <laughs> you could look at this for hours and still be finding uh, various conspiracy theories and um, religious ideas in there. Um, but if we, if we slide up here, immediately we're into UFOs and kind of UFO conspiracy stuff. Um, the importance of that for me was that I, in my 2016 book, I focused on the role of UFOs as an idea that um, would often lead people from uh, kind of new age ideas into more conspiratorial ideas and sometimes the reverse as well. It does happen. It's less common. But um, somebody like Jim Mars, for instance, um, was an example of someone who'd moved more and more into kind of new age and alternative ideas from a, a strict kind of a JFK conspiracism background. If we then move up to the top right corner and suddenly we're into these uh, particularly new age kind of ideas and especially a late new age, more of an American new age um, focused around the idea of the great awakening, uh, fifth density and all this kind of stuff. The David Wilcox Ra communications kind of um, 11, 11 kind of style uh, can, uh, new age stuff. Um, and I've been more and more interested in how uh, these kind of movements and shifts happen. Um, and so today I want to introduce a, a sort of way of 
thinking about this movement um, through mapping the cultic milieu. So the cultic milieu, if you're not familiar, is a term that comes from the sociologist Colin Campbell. Um, I think from 1963, 1964, something like that. Um, and Campbell was actually trying to come up with an explanation for how it was that although what they were still calling and thinking of as cults in those days, they, these new charismatic religions were constantly popping up and uh, dissolving away and new ones popping up in their stead. And so the actual cults were... Uh, constantly changing, but there was always a continuity of the fact that there were similar new religious movements. And he came up with this idea of the cultic milieu, which he described as the cultural kind of underground of society. It's, a, a, it's where all of the uh, stigmatized knowledge, that is ideas that are you know, stigmatized, superseded, um, uh, marginalized in various ways, um, be they religious, pseudoscientific, conspiratorial, all of those things. And a, a way to think about it is uh, this sort of relationship between mycelium and mushrooms. So the mycelium is, is widespread, but diffuse and kind of fragile. But if you get the right set of circumstances, then it will produce these um, fruiting bodies, which are, are much more visible. Um, and the idea of stigmatized knowledge is, is uh, actually relates to what David was talking about. So he, um, I think you used slightly different terms. He was epistemic vigilance. He was talking about, um, and the way that these that scientific and religious knowledge were just um, uh, authorized and justified in different ways. And uh, there will be ideas that are contrary to the epistemic authorities at any time. And that's essentially what we're talking about, stigmatized knowledge. Now, it's not a solid, constant set of ideas. It's constantly shifting, constantly changing as ideas um, come in and out of fashion or are, you know, disproven or, or, or the alternative. Um, Now, I, I actually take it, it slightly further than Kaminsky. I, I think that we can identify a number of different ways in which people um, legitimize knowledge. Um, so scientific is one, but um, I don't think that there's a specific religious uh, mode of knowledge, of uh, reasoning for knowledge. I think that there are that religion is a mixture of tradition that is uh, trust in authority in institutions institutional authority and um channeled uh knowledge which is knowledge that comes from a, a, a higher or supernatural source um add to that you also have experience now experience uh, a number of scholars have noted the way in which experience personal experience has become um, the dominant mode of, of uh, motivation in certain fields and, and much, much more important for uh, just, you know, the everyday world than it was, um, say, 50 or 70 years ago. Um, and I think that's, that's significant when we're talking about <clears throat> both sort of spiritual discourse and, new, and um, conspiracy discourse course, because um, the problem with the experiential uh, proof of things is that it's entirely personal and internal. Um, and then we also have um, one which I've, I'm either calling synthetic or intuitive, which is the idea of putting lots of different disparate parts of information together to create um, a larger whole. A anyone who's, you know, looked into David Icke's work will be <clears throat> well familiar with the idea of being a dot connector um but you know the map i showed at the beginning is actually a very good example of that that simply by listing a lot of different things that you seem to suggest some sort of connection between those things <clears throat> that um, may or may not in fact be there the other aspect that this is important is it's the idea of 
areas of shared concern um, or you know discursive units if you want to be more technical uh, that's the idea that there are certain topics which are of interest to uh, a number of different groups and these concerns if you got interested in say you were you were in, interested in kind of new age ideas about energy and healing and these kind of things you're going to come into the into contact with the idea that there were communications from extraterrestrials guiding the planet before too long you're then going to it's quite possible that you're going to get in, um, more and more interested in that UFO aspect. And once you get into the UFO stuff, you're almost certainly going to come into contact with, um, with conspiracy theories. I mean, conspiracy and uh, spiritual ideas about UFOs were literally there within two years of the first sighting in 1947 um, and have always been uh, traveling together since then right up till the modern day but ufos it's the one i've i've spent the most time looking at but it's far from the um the only one i mean uh, alternative history is a very a big one you know that um what that archaeology is somehow wrong or ignoring particular societies or misunderstanding ancient technology or whatever um Holism, the idea that everything is connected and things mean much more than they appear to uh, is an important one. Teleology, the idea that history is moving towards some um, some event, whether that's, uh, you know, interpreted positively or negatively, be it, you know, millennial or apocalyptic. Um, but the one I think is most relevant today is uh, the idea of alternative health. Um, health issues actually seem to be one of the most important and perhaps most powerful areas of concern that lead people into uh, conspiracy thinking. Um, and especially when we get these relatively um, widespread and mainstreamed kind of conspiracy narratives, uh, such as both COVID um, anti-vax kind of stuff, but also uh, QAnon, um, albeit in a slightly different way. Um, so what I'm suggesting we can do then is we can sort of map uh, the cultic milieu to give us a better idea of how people move around um, in it we can map it topographically that is we can sort of map different areas within the cultic milieu which is similar i suppose to what mar was doing although um focusing entirely on on the internet um but we can also look epidemiologically so we can look at the way that the ideas move and spread and transform through the cultic milieu and also how um, particular individuals move through different areas within the cultic milieu. Uh, and so uh, this is to sort of help you visualize this and I was I was given pause that this symbol appeared in Mars slideshow earlier on and I've had a sudden horror that I've accidentally used some horrible far right symbol by accident. I, I thought the three overlapping symbols was John Bonham's single from Led Zeppelin 4, but um, I hope that's all it is. Anyway, we have these three overlapping kind of areas where we, the conspiratorial milieu, the right wing milieu and the uh, holistic milieu there at the top, New Age. Um, what we can do is we can identify these different kind of ideas and shared um, areas of concern between these different groups. So for instance, between the new age and the alt-right, you have similar concerns, you know, such as organic food and a kind of back to the land ruralism. Um, and between the alt-right and conspiracy theories, you tend to have these, you know, anti-Semitic material, for instance, and the Eurabia theory that, you know, the sort of great replacement that the, the white race is being replaced by um, 
Islam, and these kind of ideas. But then you also have ideas that are shared by all three of these milieus, such as UFOs, um, big pharma, so alternative health narratives, and uh, QAnon uh, at the moment. And so we can, what we can do is we can chart how people move um, from one area uh, through to other areas by tracing the way that they engage with these ideas. Um, I mean, to, to take a very quick example and, and one that I often return to, uh, David Icke is a very good example of this. His um, original introduction, I guess, to kind of new age ideas was looking for a remedy for his arthritis. He, he had very bad rheumatoid arthritis, very young, and, and he couldn't get any um, relief from conventional painkillers. So he went to a spiritual, a spiritual healer. And uh, after that, he started working with um, with them as a channeler um, and that's when the sort of famous spiritual enlightening and and the Wogan interview and all that stuff that he's famous for now happened um, but you can trace the way that his ideas move through a very uh, traditional kind of theosophical new age idea with a you know there there's a there's a strong teleology there's a, a new age change coming that's going to transform the world and there's going to be earth changes and all these uh, apocalyptic uh, millennial ideas gradually gets replaced with by about 1995 with the idea that this isn't going to happen because it's being prevented by you know hitherto unsuspected conspiratorial powers now since then he's predominantly focused on explaining those powers and gradually there's been a bit of a reconciliation back into some an area that's a little less keen on engaging with the right and much more relativizing the the different powers um all within a kind of uh, a, you know a spiritual balance to some degree um so his his ultimate end would be somewhere in the middle rather than a move straight into the all right but there are examples of people starting off with new new age ideas and and uh, utterly embracing kind of holocaust denial anti-semitism and um openly all right uh, positions i don't unfortunately have time to go into all of those examples today um The, the other thing to remember, I think, is when we're talking about it in terms of conspiracies and New Age just as much, is that belief is not um, quite as simple a thing as we have tended to think of it, especially um, maybe less so in, in the study of religion in the last 20, 30 years, but still in, in uh, you know, in political science, in certain psychological works and certainly the mainstream press where we think about you know belief in something it's not a, a, a question of a simple yes and no binary and um, rather belief seems to operate rather situationally essentially you can think of it as having a, like a set of options that we can draw upon in different situations and these might come from you know, we uh, you, the David Icke example is a good example. We we would probably start with conventional medicine, but if that's not working, we might be prepared to uh, try acupuncture if we wouldn't have before, or even a spiritualist. And anything that um, works is likely to be drawn upon. And in fact, David was talking a little bit about that as well. But where health issues come into it is is it's these existential issues these issues that affect a person's life and sense of um sense of well-being um you know in a direct sort of bodily sense i think are the ones which you see making the leap into the mainstream and, and covid's an example of that um QAnon's an example of that as well through the sort of not so much through the trump end of it but more through the the child abuse satanic ritual abuse end of it and certainly in the uk most of the QAnon focused stuff has actually revolved around um claims of against paedophilia and child abuse and so on 
Anyway, very quickly, um, I think it's important to remember that anti-vax stuff um, that we're seeing at the moment is not new. Here's one from 1888 at the top left here where you see one of the favorite statements of the anti-vaccinationists is that medical men support vaccination because they profit by performing the operation. And there were a number of, of different examples of anti-vac conspiracy theories all the way from about 1800 when the first um, cowpox vaccinations were done right up to the modern age. And I wanted to remind us of um, the uh, the MMR autism um, idea from a few years ago. I'm going to rush through it because I'm almost out of time. But uh, the basic claim was by this uh, British doctor, Andrew Wakefield, who published in The Lancet, that there was a connection between the measles, mumps and rubella jab and childhood autism. Um, it was picked up by a number of mainstream sources, uh, but especially the model and presenter, Jenny McCarthy, who had previously described her child as being a crystal child, which is a, a variation of indigo children, a new age motif. Um, and so she, she was initially trying to engage with her, with her child's autism in a very new age register. But um, she had uh, what she calls an awakening after reading Andrew Wakefield's paper when she decided that her uh, diagnosis had been caused by um, by the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, although uh, she to some degree walked back the claim as to just being curious later on. However, if you look at her most recent work, um, she uh, definitely in endorsed the kind of big pharma narrative um, wholesale. And in her more recent radio and TV interviews, she has uh, had a number of examples of chatting to um, UFO and conspiracy figures, including Stephen Greer, Corey Good, James Gilliland, and uh, J.P. Sears, who you might know as that sort of uh, comedy spirituality figure, but is actually quite a prominent um, New Age anti-vaxxer himself. So just to sum up very quickly, Jenny McCarthy then is a, is a good example of this kind of movement through um, from kind of new age ideas into conspiratorial ideas through these shared areas of discourse and especially when they centre around health. I'll uh, stop now and um, so that we've got plenty of time for questions. Thank you. Ah, thank you, David. Really exciting paper. So finally we get to the question, the Q&A time. Um, and I would ask all the presenters to come back. Thank you, Ma and David. Um, so I will go to the first question here uh, from Monique Scheer. Uh, thanks, David, for a fascinating talk. You focused on the cognitive aspects, as you said, but do you have any insights on the emotional aspects of conspirituality? Are there typical emotions, perhaps unexpected ones, shared in this community? My very first attempt at an answer uh, was, well, first of all, to comment that it's a very good question. I, I wish I knew more. It's clear that anxiety can play a part, so anxiety about COVID, for example, and vaccines. Uh, there's, as I mentioned in my talk, a good deal of resentment, I think, by people who are not accorded the respect that experts have um, so that kind of demogra uh, democratic pushback against the power of elite authority and resentment of it uh, is an important one. But these are uh, prime areas for investigation, and I'd be very curious to know if uh, others have thoughts on this. Thank you, David. Um, there's a question for... Ma, um, thank you, Ma, for the presentation. I did something similar analyzing telegram channels. This is from Alexandra Blinkover. So she analyzed telegram channels. Do you think the agenda might differ on various platforms that it, as it depends on well, as well on the age of the users? Have you witnessed it? 
Yes, I think it's important to say that, for instance, when we talk about Twitter, Twitter is not a public sphere, it's not a democratic public sphere. There are some kind of actors that are, 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 are more active in the Twitter sphere. So uh, th this is important that maybe I, I haven't said, no, that this is not representative of, of the public conversation going on. No? I think that it's representative of a certain part of the population that keeps the conversation in a certain space, especially politicized, especially uh, I mean to, to make a claim into the public sphere. For this reason, I think that the uh, extreme right is much more uh, active in Twitter than for instance, the holistic spirituality actors who are much more active in another platform. For instance, in Telegram, I, I haven't done it yet, a systematic analysis uh, of Telegram together with Jordi with the big data uh, perspective, but I, I'm part of, of, of 10 of these groups. Um, and, and, and each one that I, and, um, and the holistic spirituality groups with some conspirationist views, usually there are few of them. Some of them are not open to everyone. The type of messages are very different. So I would not say that maybe age, age has a role there also as, as gender, but I cannot say what role they have there, but I'm sure that, uh, Twitter has a bias towards this kind of public uh, far right speakers that give them a, a clear platform. And there are other media like Telegram, but also like blogs, some type of, of blogging that's more uh, Instagram that goes more with holistic spirituality uh, media. Um, thank you, Ma. While we wait, big, uh, more questions for David Robertson. There's another question because David both spoke before, so there will be more questions here. But the next one is, hello, David, absolutely phenomenal presentation. Thank you. I had a question. Where do we draw the line between skepticism and trust in certain systems we have? For example, the World Health Organization not recommending wearing masks initially, However, a skeptical approach would perhaps, could perhaps be helpful in such a situation. Thank you. You know, one of the comments that I made in my talk is that we're all in the business of trying to work out who and what to trust and who and what to doubt. And to that extent, people who are immersed in conspiracy or conspirituality are no different from anyone else. They've simply made different choices about what's trustworthy and uh, what we should be skeptical about. It, to that extent, it's difficult purely on the grounds of method, if you like, to critique them. Um, I, I do think though that there's a difference in how open to revision people are. Uh, the, key point, I think, from a more scientific perspective is that one does need to be open to the possibility that you're wrong and when new information emerges to adjust your position accordingly. And that's, in a sense, what the WHO did with masks. You know, it's an absolutely fair point that in common with many scientific authorities, uh, some of the advice early on in retrospect doesn't look wonderful, uh, but we have learnt as we've uh, gone through this past year and made changes as a result. It, if there's a characteristic of uh, the spiritual or indeed conspiratorial approach, I think it's to be stuck in a particular position and to explain away all counterexamples or counterarguments. So that, that would be my response. Thank you, David. Uh, a question for the other David, David Robertson um, from Sharon Jagger. Um, I really enjoyed your talk. What are your thoughts about the moves by some platforms to remove actors like David Icke? Does this feed the conspiracy? And why is there a pushback against such ideas circulating freely? Is that um, yeah, I, 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 I wouldn't do it myself. Um, I, I think there's a real danger of making martyrs out of, out of people. Um, 
but I also think there's, um, I don't know, there's a lot of difference between different people. I, I my feeling is that the, the mainstreaming of, of conspiracy ideas recently has got much more to do with mainstream media than it has to do with um, with blogs and stuff like that. That um, the increasing ownership of all media stations by a few people who are <laughs> known kind of political influencers and things like Fox News rather than um, you know more objective news stories is much more of a problem. I feel that the pushback against people on social media is largely to do with, as I said, with this sort of existential matter. As David was saying that 10 years ago, the public perception of a conspiracy theorist was a sort of middle-aged guy living in his basement with tinfoil hat on. And um, the mainstream media largely continued that kind of narrative until QAnon happened, at which point it was suddenly there was something that might actually directly affect, um, you know, American politics and especially the lives of the predominantly left leaning journalists who were covering it. And that became even more amplified when when the shutdown happened, because suddenly everybody was looking entirely online for news stories and there was very little else that was happening. Um, and so I, I feel that that's where the sudden kind of reaction against this stuff came from when, you know, people have been complaining about the dominance of particular kinds of voices on particular social media platforms for at least a decade and um, have done very little about it. I doubt that it will do the slightest thing to David Icke. He's, he's been banned on many, many things previously and he has his own uh, audience. Um, there are people who um, will be affected much more greatly. And I think the one I did, the one I did approve of was when YouTube demonetized um, a lot of people because that took away a major source of income for people who are not so much people who believe irrational things but people who deliberately provoke controversy and hatred in order to make money and I'm people talking about people like Paul Joseph Watson for instance um, who make a, a living just saying absolutely horrible things um, a largely apparently just because they want to make a living and so, so that I agreed with. Thanks, David. Um, the next question is for David Boss. Um, hi, David. J. Daniel Thompson here from RMIT University in Melbourne. Uh, great paper. You talked about general weariness and distrust of experts. I'm wondering how a more general anti-intellectualism plays into this distrust. We elsewhere witness this anti-intellectualism in right-wing attacks on the university. Thanks. I think there is a clear connection. Um, I suggested in a, a quick written response uh, that if I could pretend to be a therapist, uh, anti-intellectualism is a kind of populist defense mechanism in other words, again, that it's coming from a place of resentment of elites. Uh, that anti-intellectualism that has always been a strong part of American culture, arguably Australian culture, though I don't want to uh, cast aspersions on a culture that's not my own, um, it is one that can easily be recycled uh, for these purposes uh, in uh, promoting skepticism about uh, expert opinion at times like this. Thanks. Thank you, David. Um, so we have a new question. Let's see. Um, a question for David Robertson. Uh, that's from Cecilia. Uh, Cecilia Delgado Molina, and she says, uh, thank you all for your wonderful presentations, but my question is to David Robertson. When you talked about these links between autism and anti-vaccines in the past, I wonder if you have identified links between ideas about indigo children 
and as a form of spirituality, autism, and anti-vaccine positions. Thank you. Uh, there are connections. I, it's not really my work. Um, I used that case study to make uh, as for a topical one because it's the, the COVID and conspirituality was the, the name of the conference. Um, I would go and look at the work of uh, Beth Singler's book on Indigo Children. It's very good on the connections between um, the initial kind of new age take on it and um, into the, the vaccine uh, skepticism later. I mean, Jenny McCarthy's a, a good example. She was talking about being, um, she was an indigo and her kid was a crystal um, before uh, the introduction, um, before her introduction to, to Andrew Wakefield's paper and the kind of um, autism connection. Um, and yeah, there, there, are, there are a number of direct connections that you can dig out fairly easily. Thanks, David. This is a question for the whole panel. Um, so that's Joel Hill who asks, do you guys think the rise of conspirituality will be reflected in the makeup of parliaments around the world? So Marjorie Taylor Greene uh, really kicked off the idea that QAnon adherents can make it in the US Congress. While our generally um, high barriers to electability hold the fringe at bay, we will be testing this with Pete Evans in Australia attempting the New South Wales Senate. With fairly low vote quotas needed to become an MEP, will you see the legitimation of conspirituality in the halls of power? Um, and he finishes by saying, apologies if this is a, a bit of a bloody long <laughs> question. So, um, um, Ma, I would invite you uh, to start to kick off and then we'll go to David and David. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christina. I have to be honest and I don't know. Um, th th for me, there are two different things that we have to take into account. First, that at least in the Spanish scenario, but also in many other countries, the far right has a strong uh, links with the uh, Christian far right. So there's this uh, entanglement between Christianity and the far right that makes it a bit more difficult to see some kind of conspirituality belief there, or at least as conspirit or at least as, as bringing them this clear holistic spiritual milieu uh, into them, into the merging. So it's uh, as this uh, this piece of the of the uh, or, or this this part of the political sphere is, is occupied by these uh, rising far right groups which are clearly uh, attaching with Christianity they use some conspiracy beliefs uh, they merge with the ideas but there's no clear conspirituality but then um, there's another point which will be some classical parties that are, are including some uh, deputies that have clear alliances with these groups for instance here, uh, in Catalonia, there was a, a big uh, controversy because one uh, the, 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 the um, parliament the parliament decided that all the deputy um, parliamentists uh, all the congressmen could uh, allow uh, um, could decide that some of the money of their salaries go for the COVID uh, health sector. So and they could decide which association could take this money. And one of the of the parliament uh, guy decided to give the money to this uh, 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 holistic spirituality group, saying that they fight COVID through uh, meditation and so on, so on. And this creates a big, big debate. Not to what extent public money can be uh, used for these groups and can be allocated to these groups. So I think that it will be a bit more merit in the way they, they, that, that the conspirituality will be into the political debate, but in 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 a in a more ambiguous way. Also, and, and just to finish, I think that there's a big tension into the holistic spirituality milieu, milieu because at least in countries like Spain, but also in France, they are really fighting to get some legitimacy in order to be uh, considered as a health providers by the government and, and, and in order to be entitled to, be, to, to have access to the public health system. And uh, some of these positions might difficult this this so I think that it's a very complex game going on 
and very difficult to predict what will happen. Like Ma, I'd have to say that I don't know. Uh, it's clear that we have conspiracy theorists as mainstream candidates. Indeed, President Trump, I think, was unquestionably somebody who qualifies as a conspiracy theorist. And before he was elected president, he was known, among other things, for promoting the so-called Bertha conspiracy. That is the idea that uh, Barack Obama was not born in the United States and therefore not qualified to be American president. Uh, and in his last days in office, but following on things he'd been claiming all the way through, uh, he was very clearly promoting baseless conspiracies about the election being stolen. So uh, we already have examples as well as the one that you quite rightly give um, of people in at least the United States being uh, elected who hold strong conspiracist positions. Whether con conspiritualists, uh, sorry, those are conspiracy theorists, whether conspiritualists would get elected, I'm not sure. Um, I think it's possible, um, but uh, we'll have to see. Thanks. I, I suspect not. Um, I So I want to make a, a, a couple of qualifiers. There, it's important when we're talking about something like uh, COVID conspiracies or QAnon especially, that we don't reify them into a single thing. There's a big range of positions within that. And Mar was kind of saying that a second ago. Um, the, the more right-wing, Christian-leaning Trump side of it is not going to have a great deal in common with the more sort of new agey, left-leaning side of it except on these very specific points at a specific kind of time when they come together. So for instance, the Unite, the, the, um, uh, the Save the Children rallies in London, for instance, you know, those are examples where the QAnon brand works quite well, but it's largely that. It's largely a brand that brings quite disparate groups together for distinct purposes. So the more right-leaning christian connected side of it yes they already are in in parliament but there's been a long long tradition of of right-leaning uh conspiratorial people in seats of government especially in the u.s um you know uh right back to mccarthyism i mean it's not it's it's not news in any sense um, the situation in Australia, I'm less familiar with. In Britain, it's slightly different because uh, despite the fact that we have hugely declining figures of um, Christian identification amongst the public, the association between the institutions of political power and the church is still very, very strong. It's very unlikely you're going to have people in high positions of political power in Britain who don't, who, or rather who identify as other than Christian. It's, it's going to be very, very unusual. We've only ever had one prime minister who was identifying as anything other than Protestant while he was in power, and that was Benjamin Disraeli. Um, Blair didn't convert to Catholicism officially until he left office. Um, so I would very much be surprised that we'll get more sort of um, alternative spirituality people in government in any way. And, and also, it's got to be remembered that that, part of the milieu tends to have very low levels of voting activity anyway they tend to or there's a larger proportion of them sort of reject politics altogether as being either pointless or part of the trap right so they're much less likely to be involved in political activity than just the average you know average member of the public whereas the right wing on the other hand are very highly motivated to to Vote. And that's why they're always in power. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, we had Alfred Deacon and we had um, also Gillard, you know, Julia Gillard, who was an atheist in, in, you know, in as a prime minister here in Australia. So that is, um, I had a question here that was really Good, good segue to that. It's for David Voss again, but um, do you guys, uh, uh, no, I think, sorry, I had to move. 
I think I see the one. It's about the, uh, the church. Well, there was the link between conspiracy theories and postmodernism. Is that uh, the one that you yeah. have in mind? The, the in one the, by Alexandra Blinkova, and she said, thank oh. you David, for the great presentation. You discussed the role of new age movements in conspirituality and its success, accessibility to conspiracy theories, but what about historic churches? I've noticed that the clerics of the Russian Orthodox Church found themselves very susceptible to conspiracy theories as well as the flock trusted them in disseminating such ideas. Yes, I think it's a very good point. Um, it, it does seem to me that we need to maybe think of both conspirituality narrowly conceived and conspirituality in a broad sense. So in the narrow sense, we're looking at the overlap between alternative spirituality and conspiracy theory. But in a broader sense, uh, it could be the overlap between any form of spirituality, conventional or unconventional, including mainstream religion and conspiracy. Uh, and indeed, I think we also need to uh, recognize, and this is a point that David Robinson was making earlier, uh, that it's the wellness community that's perhaps particularly vulnerable to conspiratorial thinking at the moment. And uh, they you know, may not even count directly as all being alternatively spiritual, but although they're sort of on the fringes of that milieu. Um, people, so thank you very much. We get to the end of um, this session on, on time. I'm very pleased because some of the people who are from you know, speaking to us and listening to us from overseas, this is very late for them so or very early for them. So thank you so much. Tomorrow we start at 9.30 and we have a really great lineup of speakers. Um, and we start, the first session is with, and I loved that expression, the Three Musketeers, the Conspirituality um, podcast, um, people that is Derek Beres, Matthew Remsky and Julian Walker. And I think it will be a fantastic um, day tomorrow. It's a whole day, but it's the same link that you can use to come in um, and listen to the paper. So you can leave and then come in again uh, with this link. And we are here and I think it will be a fantastic day. So come back please tomorrow at 9.30 in the morning. If you can't just, you can come back throughout the day and we'll be here discussing conspirituality in um, science and COVID-19 and I think will be a fantastic day. So thank you so much for being with us today and I will see you all tomorrow at um, 9.30 in the morning Australian time or at least I should say Melbourne and Sydney Eastern Australian time uh, other times in other parts of the world. So thank you so much and I'll see you tomorrow.